So this is kind of what these sites will typically look like. Um, it's been grazed for a very long time. Um, the livestock have free access to the stream. That's where they get their water from. Um, but you can see, looking around, there are a lot of areas that the livestock are not eating the vegetation. It's not necessarily good forage. Um, additionally, of course, it's not good for them to be in the stream, drinking their own wastewater. Um, it's, it's not good for them. It's obviously not good for the stream. Um, and typically, these areas aren't always great for pasture production either, for forage. Um, so it can really benefit the landowner to exclude the livestock from these muddy areas um, and from along the stream and to plant the buffer. Um, but we just have to make sure they can still use that pasture you know, adjacent to the buffer. Um, so upfront planning is a really, really important part of this process. Um, fencing, you have to uh, get really down into details about where that fence is gonna go, uh, making sure that it's far enough away from the stream so that you can still plant enough trees that you need within there. Um, you know, the minimum in the Chesapeake Bay watershed for a riparian forest buffer is 35 feet. So if you put that fence right at 35 feet from the stream, um, you're not going to be able to plant that last row of trees, you know, right next to that fence. You're going to have to make sure there's enough room to mow in between the fence and the last row of trees. You're also going to have to make sure there's room to mow in between the row of trees that's next to the stream uh, and the stream. Um, and so typically, if you do 35 feet on one of these properties that have livestock involved, um, you're only gonna be able to fit two rows of trees in there. So planning for that, making sure you're planting species that uh, are going to very quickly cover up um, that area uh, and, and provide shade on that stream is pretty important. There's a little bit, it's, it's a lot less forgiving, I guess is what I'm getting at. Um, additionally, uh, invasive loads can vary. Um, right now, there's not really much around because the horses and the cows are eating pretty much everything except you know what isn't good forage. Um, but as soon as we let this go, it's gonna grow up uh, very quickly. So continuing to maintain, doing the mowing, doing the spraying, um, but also being very careful about invasives coming in is really, really important. Um, when working with the livestock exclusion, uh, that's kind of has to be more part of the buffer considerations than you might initially think. Um, the best thing to do is to follow NRCS, Natural Resource Conservation Service standards for any sort of uh, agricultural practice, um, but making sure that you have a fence that's going to work for the producer um, and be good enough at excluding them from the buffer is really important. Um, I've learned from my failures that uh, uh, we don't want to take a chance with this fence. We want to put a lot of money and time and intention into the fence because when the fence goes, the buffer will go. Um, cows especially will just plow over every single tree. Um, horses like to sort of play with the trees, so they'll knock a lot over. But if animals get into that buffer, then it's, it's bad news, no matter what. Um, so we really want to keep them out. Um, so using the right kind of gates is really important. There are many gate options out there. I prefer to use metal gates that are going to cost a little bit more um, and are going to be a little bit harder to open and close rather over spring gates. Um, but they're a lot more resilient to livestock, um, to uh, long-term damage and use. Um, I don't really trust those spring gates anymore. And keeping the animals out of the buffer is everything. Making sure there's sufficient fencing uh, with enough strands, making sure those strands have sufficient electricity is really important too if the producer wants an electrified fence. Um, if they don't want an electrified fence, um, that could be for a variety of reasons, but um, the nice thing about an electrified fence is that the debris will wrap around it for sure and you have to get that debris off of the fence quickly after that happens in say a, a flood event um, because when the, the fence is covered with debris, the current is gonna go out and the animals can push in. Um, but uh, if it's not a high tensile fence or it's not electrified at all, um, it's gonna be much more of a, of a sieve for debris. A lot of the woven wire fences that are producers who don't want that high tensile electrified fence. Um, so that's a, another consideration to think of. But again, working with the landowner, figuring out what they need for their livestock um, and how to accommodate that you know, around the buffer still is really important. Um, on that note, what we like to do is help them use this buffer as an opportunity to set up a rotational grazing system. So that they're actually, rather than this is just a huge 20-ish acre pasture, splitting it up into paddocks so this producer can manage those paddocks, can move the animals around it, 
and give some paddocks a rest. So it actually will increase the forage potential of that pasture adjacent to the buffer if it's designed properly. And again, it's really important to work with your partners at NRCS uh, and other agencies who more specialize in this um, to make sure that's done properly. Um, part of that rotational grazing setup um, and even just the, the buffer itself is typically gonna be livestock crossings, um, which are really, really important because not only does that allow the livestock to get to the other side of the buffer, um, but that's typically the water access point for them as well. Um, uh, if a livestock crossing doesn't have to be a part of the buffer, alternative watering sources are also really important. Again, usually they are accessing the stream for their water. Um, so some folks will uh, basically have a crossing that only goes halfway through the stream, and it's just a little cutout, and then the crossing sits in the stream so the animals can come in on an improved walkway that kind of slices through the buffer, get their water, and then get out. They're not going to congregate in the stream. They don't have free access to the stream or the buffer at all. Um, but I try to do alternative watering systems that doesn't put them into the stream at all if we don't have to have them crossing through. And again, work with your NRCS office, and they typically have programs to help cost share that um, in addition to whatever funds you're bringing in on the buffer side. Uh, one of the challenges with planting in a pasture situation um, is the high amount of diversity. Um, it's not as easy as say a crop field or an existing lawn or even a hay field um, to manage, to mow even. There's a lot of pockets that are too wet to mow. Um, there's a lot of valleys and dips and swales and um, there's just a lot more diversity and obstacles in the landscape that we'll have to account for. One of the big questions that people always have is where can I plant trees? Where shouldn't I plant trees? How can you tell what's a wetland and we should kind of leave as a wetland? Should we try to plant trees in that wetland? Um, and so on. And so um, I would say a lot of that dep depends on your funding. Um, it depends on the other circumstances in your area. Um, here in southeastern Pennsylvania, we do have bog turtles. Um, they're not very common anymore, um, but that is a concern, and that is a concern for a lot of the Bay watershed where we're doing a lot of reforestation work, um, is these these herbaceous wetlands are the only habitat for bog turtles, and there's not a lot of them on the landscape, so um, it is uh, really not great to reforest these, which would then reduce the bog turtle habitat. Um, at least that's the stance that uh, a lot of agencies have taken. Um, so to just uh, eliminate that issue and that question, what I like to do is just uh, plant around the wetland, not really plant trees in an emergent wetland. Um, however, you have to kind of have an eye for what is a wetland and what isn't a wetland. Um, we've looked at reed canary grass a lot. Um, reed canary grass is a, uh, is a facultative wetland species, meaning that it'll grow in wet areas, but that doesn't, just because it's there, doesn't mean that it's a wetland per se. There are other species like sweet flag, a chorus calamus, um, which kind of looks like cattail, but doesn't have the, the cattail parts. Um, this to me is a, an indicator that we almost certainly do have uh, wetland conditions. Um, from the federal standpoint, a wetland requires uh, wetland diagnostic vegetation, hydrology, and soil. So you have to look at all of those things, three things together um, to kind of to make a determination to technically call things a wetland. Um, we don't really have the resources to do an actual wetland determination to hire someone to do a wetland delineation. So we have to kind of use rough indicators in the field to sort of figure out what is a wetland, where should I plant, where shouldn't I plant. And again, the vegetation is a really important part of that. When I see sweet flag, I know that we almost certainly do have a wetland. Additionally, one of the things you can look for is wetland indicator soils. So the fact that we have uh, intermittent saturation in these soils means that um, we will have conditions uh, that are aerobic, where we don't have much oxygen in the soil of something that is saturated long enough to be counted as a wetland. Um, and so what you can do is you can look at the soil for some of these indicators. And, um, oh boy, I love the smell of this right now. Uh, the sweet flag smells really good, and I actually really love the smell of wetland soils. Um, so what we're looking for here, the technical term for this is redoxomorphic features. Basically, usually soil is kind of brown, right? A darker brown color. Um, if it is saturated for uh, uh, a majority of the time, 
those anoxate conditions are going to change the soil chemistry because the bacteria uh, and the plants and the other life in the soil are consuming other resources when they can't consume oxygen. So what happens is the chemistry of the soil changes uh, such that particles like um, manganese, uh, other things, iron especially, are moving around in the soil and are being depleted from some areas and are being accumulated in other areas. Here we have very light gray soil as the matrix, which is kind of the dominant part of the soil. And then there's all these little red features um, throughout here. And they're, they're kind of hard to see. They might be harder to see on the camera, um, but those are concentrated in these stripes. Those stripes are where the roots have gone down. That's puncturing through and providing a tiny bit more oxygen there um, and other resources. So that is where iron is accumulating. That's where that red happens. And because the iron is being bled from the other areas in the soil where it's so anaerobic that not a lot of life can happen, um, we're getting that grayer color there and that darker red color there um, on the pore lining. And so if you see these features, you likely, that is an indicator of wetland soils. That doesn't mean it's necessarily a wetland, it has to meet those other features, um, but that means to me uh, that it can help make our decision about what is a wetland, where should we plant, where shouldn't we plant. Um, trees will grow in wetlands, um, but uh, again, if you can maintain them or not is another question, um, and if the regulations around you allow for planting trees in a wetland is also something that you know, may or may not be the case. Um, something that if a landowner really wants to reforest an area and it's mostly just that reed canary grass that's not providing any habitat value and I know is not going to be able to harbor things like bog turtles or any other sensitive species, um, something that you can do is live stake, uh, a bigger live staking than just into the bank, but tons and tons and tons of live stakes, um, depending on what your density you want, but usually a very high number into that wetland. Um, because if you can't do the maintenance mowing or the spraying, um, at least if you really hammer it with live stakes, um, they have a pretty decent chance of, uh, of survival and for it uh, becoming a, a, a shrubby or a, a forested wetland.